to talk about how to run API metrics to your business objectives. Able to hear me okay? Hello, Jeric. We see you. We hear you. Welcome. Awesome. Let me just uh, uh, share my so screen here. Now you can uh, share your screen. All right. One of uh, my personal favorite topics, and uh, hopefully for a lot of folks here, how do you actually align API metrics to product objectives? Really quick back background about myself. I'm the CEO of Mosef, an API analytics platform, and I personally love IPAs. Uh, I wish I had a few behind me here, but it's mostly it looks like uh, some Flickr and a few other things. But why are we talking about this? There's plenty of metrics to monitor infrastructure. You know, familiar with tools like Datadog to New Relic, APM tools. And what do they provide visibility on? Things like memory usage, requests per second, uh, SLA metrics. But in reality, when we think about what a product manager owns and is accountable for, it's not any of these things. Instead, they're focused on things like adoption, engagement and usage with the APIs. Uh, how do you make sure customers uh, stick around, uh, what we call uh, retention? And sometimes these are actually hard to draw back to those initial metrics I was just talking about around requests per second and those type of things. Now, as a secondary to that, we need to understand who's getting value from this API. After all, one of the most important things for a product manager is to ensure you're always creating value, building something that uh, uh, customers would want. But there might be a few different stakeholders involved. You have the engineering teams, you have different business goals, leadership, and some of these might uh, conflict in a way. You know, engineering is looking for something that's highly reliable and uh, uh, can get out as soon as possible with low maintenance. On the other hand, leadership is looking for specific reports uh, metrics they can show to their management uh, why this particular API program or initiative uh, requires more funding, right? Why should we keep it going? So I'm going to talk on each three of these different carry, uh, categories, first starting with adoption, then a walk through engagement, and the last one is retention, which is always the, the three big goals for uh, product owners and managers. Let's start with what does it mean to have product adoption? Well, you have to start off with what is the transactions that are actually creating customer value? This can vary based off of the type of API that you're creating, who your customers are, and the space that you're in. For example, if you're an e-commerce app, you know, making a checkout or making a purchase uh, is creating something of value. But if you're a data API, you know, some of that is you know, hosting data that you query against, like a identity verification API, a, geo, uh, a geolocation API, you know, it's not really around checkouts and purchases. Instead, you're, you're measuring uh, successful lookups. You know, how quick does it take for someone to make that initial uh, lookup or, or what we call our first hello world? And if we map this to a funnel, we can actually see a couple of different goals or milestones that most new customers that are getting on board with the API have to go through. Well, first they have to discover your, your platform. And you know, that here is listed as a page visit. And then they sign up, right? Okay, they, they generate their API keys. They're still not really using your API platform in any way. All they were able to do is sign up and, and, and see the API key, maybe take a look at your onboarding flow. And at this point, there's a lot of times a, a decent pause, right? They, they have to evaluate documentation, they may have to go to different areas, and eventually they're able to make that first hello world. Again, if you're a payments API, that first hello world may be making a single payment transaction within your sandbox environment. Um, but again, I mean, that's still not realizing the full value from the API or the platform. And that's where we have this final step, which is called realized value. There's a couple of different terms for this. Sometimes it's called uh, time to first working app, time to uh, revenue generation. Um, but I'll just keep it simple here in terms of uh, realized value. One of the tricky things with API platforms, though, is this is not one single app or site that you can take a look at. In this case, we can see the blue actions are actually web actions. You can use a, a UI tracking tool like Mixpanel, Amplitude. There's a variety of them out there. But then what happens after that sign up? Right? How, how do you then correspond that to what's happening on the API side? 
And that's where uh, API analytics or, or API uh, product analytics uh, uh, really comes to the forefront to start tracking things like making a single API call, making uh, the first 100 payment transactions, and so on. But equally important beyond just tracking those transactions is how do you find your, your funnel goals? In this case, I'm laying out a three-stage funnel. First one being sign up. Second one, making a single API transaction. And this could be in, say, a sandbox environment. But again, you're not still have a full working app deployed yet. And that's where the green box on the right side, that third step, uh, really becomes important. In this case, we're saying any customer that has made over 100 payment transactions through this API is considered getting value from it. Maybe that's our aha moment or, 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 or that value creation phase. Now, each one of these steps, you have a couple of things you're looking at. One, conversion rate. Uh, not surprisingly, you're trying to understand the activation rate from sign up to making that first API call. But then also equally important is the time to convert. You know, for traditional web apps, that time to convert might only take a few minutes. You know, you, you add a pair of shoes to your, your checkout uh, or, or, or your bag of goods and you pay for it. And then it's done. It's very transactional. But for these API platforms, which you know is very heavy in the enterprise or B2B space, you know there might be a lot of obstacles that a, a new developer has to go through first before they're able to go from you know, step one to step two or step two to step three, which could include compliance review, could include security review. Um, but measuring where you need to focus, is it around your adoption piece or is it around they're not able to deploy this in production, right? Once you have that answer, you're able to better optimize your product strategy around adoption. This is one tip we've seen uh, from some of our customers at MOSAF, which is guide them to that next step, right? You know, if they haven't made any API calls seven days were, uh, right after sign up, then, you know, guide them to this is a documentation, this is a case study, this is how you should maybe use in the API. Maybe they're just waiting to see that value. Um, if they already made that first API call, but they still haven't done anything beyond kicking the tires, then maybe they need some uh, ad additional enablement material to share with their uh, uh, manager, to share with the rest of the team to get more stakeholders involved. Maybe they're not the ones that is blocking this from moving to the next step, but could be another stakeholder. After all, for a lot of API platforms out there, they're very B2B focused. So I touched briefly on just adoption funnel, right? But really the meat of it is how do you actually drive people to use your API and increase that API usage over time? Uh, there's a couple of different ways to look at this. There's what we call bad or vanity metrics, and then there's good metrics, right? Right here I'm listing a, a bad metric, which is request per second. You know, sometimes people call this RPS or queries per second. Why is that a bad metric? Well, you could have things like health probes. You could actually have just bad integrations where they're requiring way too much for uh, what they actually need. Maybe the, the pagination uh, scheme that you have for your API is just incorrect, right? So now they have to do a huge dump. Um, how do you actually help uh, 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 get to a more measurable metric? Well, one is weekly active tokens, right? How many unique different API keys are being used to access the API? whether it's on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, whatever makes sense in terms of your KPI reporting. Um, but then again, you know, you can have some issues where a single developer created 10 different API keys for different environments, uh, maybe for security reasons, they have a couple of different integration points. And that's why we usually recommend the best metric, which is weekly active users. Uh, this can vary depending on your industry um, for something that's a little more consumer driven, uh, might be just weekly active users itself. Uh, for something that's a little bit more on the B2B side, you might be tracking weekly active accounts. Um, if you have a marketplace, it might be weekly act active integrations or weekly active apps. Um, but just a way for you to uh, roll this data up and, and then exclude things like those health probes and things that really don't matter because your customer's not getting any value from your API at that point. But then again, even though we're tracking weekly active users, you don't really understand who is accessing your API. 
And this is where you can start adding things like user attributes, whether it's the, the customer name, industry they're in, do things like their the role and experience level, are they at the VP level? Are the individual developer integrating your API? This really understands uh, and gives visibility to your core audience. Because again, I mean, you're gonna have multiple stakeholders to go after. And how can you actually leverage these different attributes to measure these usage metrics? Well, now we're able to break this down by company name. But I could equally change this around to company industry. Is it software and services that is growing the most? Or is it something in FinTech or healthcare or somewhere else? And this allows me to uh, tell my uh, uh, sales team or my growth teams, this is where we should be focusing on in terms of trying to grow this API program. Just having user identifiers probably is not gonna give you enough information for really true self-service analytics. This is what's something we believe in here at Mosif. But that's not all. There's one more thing that we usually recommend uh, customers to do in terms of understanding API usage. And that is actually looking at the payloads themselves, right? These payloads might be JSON, could be XML, some other uh, uh, text or binary format, but it's usually very business specific and application specific. In this case with uh, e-commerce platform, you might wanna track which categories are out of stock or how often a customer uh, sees you know, and, and queries the item that is out of stock. Whereas going back to that data API case, you know, you're looking at things like match rate. Was it found in the database? Um, what is the probability that a, a customer was able to find something in the database? Because at every single transaction uh, that they call on your API was always a miss or, or maybe 0% match rate. Are they really getting value out of your API or are they just making a bunch of API calls that's driving up usage without anything to go uh, with it. As example, for this e-commerce app, now we're able to break this down by response body label. In this case, this is a num type on this API showing uh, weekly users who saw unavailable versus available and out of stock. It looks like May 7th and May 21st, we had some spikes. A lot more things were out of stock during those days. Uh, and then we can dig in why was it out of stock? Is it something around the API itself? Were they querying for the wrong things or wrong categories? Or is it more of a, a, a business problem? Maybe it was just during uh, Black Friday and uh, just a lot more stuff was traditionally out of stock versus uh, uh, normal trends without any type of holiday in the picture. Now, by combining these two different items, the business uh, uh, analysis of your, of your API payloads or, or body analytics, along with adding these customer attributes, now we can truly understand who had a bad experience, right? Uh, a bad experience in this case is not necessarily just around latency, but it's the fact that, you know, they weren't able to get what they're expecting from the API. Um, you can look at this third uh, column here, out of stock, and take a look at which customers, which, which of my clients is experiencing that a little more. And that allows maybe a solutions architect or customer success rep to drill into uh, their usage levels and, hey, provide some recommendations. Looks like you're uh, uh, getting stuff out of stock a lot more than most of our other customers. This is a way to mitigate that. There's one area I want to touch on also, which is around product retention. Uh, this is one of the least known uh, uh, metrics uh, in terms of uh, understanding it and how to leverage it, but sometimes one of the most important because it's very, very hard to fix and it requires truly thinking about what to optimize for. But what is product retention? It shows you where you have a leaky boat. In this case, I am plotting you know, how many people who signed up on day zero in a particular cohort is still active day one, day two, day three, and so on. And you can plot this out you know, on, on a weekly level, on a monthly level, whatever makes sense for your uh, management reporting. Uh, but in this case, usually daily or weekly is sufficient. A good retention curve usually flattens out. In this case, you're always gonna have a, a group of people who sign up, but then after one day, just wasn't able to see that uh, uh, first Hello World quick enough. Maybe they're stuck in uh, uh, or, or switch project priorities. 
But once they do get integrated, we would like this curve to flatten out. And sometimes people even say that's a smile curve because you can actually have people who activate and start driving up usage, you know, after a couple of weeks of using your platform. If this curve drew, uh, went all the way down to zero, that's a problem. That means I'm getting a lot of people to sign up and start using my API, but after a couple of days or after a couple of weeks, they stopped, right? Why did they stop? Who knows? Maybe it's SDK issues, integration issues, just wasn't able to find a good use case for the API. Looked exciting, lots of bells and whistles, but didn't really solve my use case as a customer. But by having a way to pivot these different uh, metrics, uh, whether it's around SDK, version that they're using, uh, different features used, you can start understanding you know, where is retention lacking and where should you actually focus your uh, product roadmap. As an example, let's add a, a quick drill down by the user agent. You know, for a lot of APIs, which is highly recommended, make sure you have a, a very well-defined criteria for what that user agent is. In this case, we're able to see different SDKs being used and integrate with this API. Node, Python, Go, and Ruby all look okay. You know, they, they drop off after day one, day two, but they stay relatively consistent, you know, 24%, 30%, and so on. But if you go down to PHP, these are folks who are integrating with this API using my PHP SDK. After day one, it pretty much drives down to zero. That's an issue. Was that because the PHP library itself is buggy? Is it because it's lacking uh, a particular set of features? This is where I might want to start uh, looking into more quantitative feedback, interviewing those folks who are using PHP. Why did they stop using the API? A couple of tips that I've seen work really well for you know API platforms is that usually they're behind the scenes. You know, the developer integrates the API, but no one else really gets to understand how is this API impacting the application and customer experience. One thing I usually recommend doing is embedding specific metrics around that integration, you know, if you are an API platform, and that could be SLA metrics for the, the uh, integrators and engineering team, but it could also mean things like uh, usage or number of transactions, such as number of SMSs sent or payment transactions. Another way to look at this is things like number of end users that are able to get benefit from this API. It's really helpful if you have a, a marketplace or, or number of integrations within that marketplace. Show your customers directly the benefits they gain from this API, because sometimes it's not measurable or can be seen directly initially. One last tip I've seen uh, over and over in terms of retention, keep your developers informed, right? Um, you know, they don't like surprises, even though, you know, you know exactly what's going on. If, if you're the product manager or product owner for this API, you know exactly when something's gonna be deprecated, you know exactly when something's gonna be rate limited and what those limits are. But as a customer of an API platform, they don't know, right? And you might actually have to uh, find a couple different communication channels to let them know these things. Uh, one is just through simple emails. In this case, you can see, you know, I have a template saying uh, you exceed your rate limits. Just, just as FYI, you know, maybe you should, you know, get on the phone with one of our uh, solutions experts that can help you mitigate and find a new solution or workaround for these rate limits. A lot of times developers sign up, you know, with their GitHub account or Google account, and you need to find another way to reach those folks because they might have less, left the organization, moved to a different department. And that's where we also recommend things like uh, warning headers that can be added automatically to your API. Uh, you might have heard a thing like X dash uh, warn uh, for saying, hey, this API is actually being deprecated. This will be sunsetted. Uh, this is a link uh, to review more documentation on it. So trying to reach and guide the developers uh, through a couple different channels can be very helpful. Uh, there's one takeaway from this talk is really optimizing for value creation and not request for seconds. Again, there's a lot of different uh, infrastructure metrics that you know uh, engineering teams like to track. Everything from request per second to you know how many instances are being used, utilization of those instances, and so on. That's not really what a customer cares about. They don't care how many CPUs you're using to 
you know, uh, allow this API to be high uh, availability or, or, or very reliable, what they care about is, are they getting any value from it, right? And having a way and methodology for not just product managers, but anyone that is a customer facing, whether that's customer success teams, systems engineers, to have these metrics and, and make the right decisions. And that's all I have, folks. Thank we you. jump over to the questions Derek, uh, We have time for a quick Q&A. You can stop sharing your screen. So let's go for you. Yeah, it's very interesting to see that in the end, APIs are product like any other. You have to find the accurate metric to uh, actually measure their success. Um, we talk about payload analysis. Um, how do you deal with sensible data uh, uh, when you do payload analysis? Uh, is there a good way to, to do that without uh, with a, a, a avoiding to put sensible data in a place where they shouldn't be? Sure, definitely. And and we usually recommend three different things to mitigate any uh, uh, sensitive data or privacy concerns. Number one, which is the easiest, just enable uh, client-side encryption. Um, this is something that we support over at MOSIF where uh, you can generate your own API keys through you know, AWS or, or AWS uh, Key Management Service or any other platform that allows that data to be encrypted within your own infrastructure before it's sent to any third-party tool. Um, that allows you know that vendor of yours to not see uh, or have access to any of that data. Uh, the second thing we usually recommend doing is if there are things that are uh, highly sensitive, such as a credit card, maybe a password, um, just scrub it immediately. Usually a password is not gonna give you as much insights versus something that's more business oriented, such as you know enum types, uh, is it out of stock? Uh, where are they querying in terms of like countries or cities? Um, that's usually not considered as much uh, of a fear versus like a social security number. Um, we already have a lot of stuff in place that says, yeah, if it looks like a credit card number, we'll just scrub it automatically. Um, and this is used by a lot of you know financial companies out there um, because sometimes you don't know, right? Lastly, uh, as long as you're able to tie that analysis back to a single customer, right? Whether that's an individual user or maybe it's a company, uh, one of the biggest things is having the ability to scrub that data or anonymize it as needed. And this is usually important for things like GDPR, CCA, CCPA compliance. Um, if you think about it, a lot of times you already have your HP headers and URL uh, query parameters log in some logs somewhere anyways. So why not tie it back to a user so you can click one button, scrub it all, anonymize it without any worry, right? It's more just having that process in place and making it easy for it to use, not just by the engineering teams, but you know everyone from the COO to to cosmic sex reps and so on. Great, great. Uh, I think we're on time. Uh, that was the perfect time for the, for this question. Thank you very much, Derek. Uh, I know. I hope that everyone knows that uh, measuring your API success is not measuring the number of requests. And uh, see you another time. And now we will welcome David O'Neill, CEO and founder of API Metrics to talk about agreeing on common standards for trust with APIs.